I would describe that as having reached my point of liberation, and by that I mean no longer uh, trapped or confused by the prison of the ego. And to put it really simply, I accepted the fact that God is all of reality, including myself, and that that's the true nature of all identity, and that that was me, so at that point I was able to uh, free myself from the prison of the ego and no longer had this question of, well, who am I? What is, you know, what's real, what's not real? It became very clear. In the moment, I accepted that, thoroughly accepted that. It was essentially like I was tripping 5-MeO-DMT for the next three months nonstop as everything just kind of opened up. And that was the point where I stopped taking anything to try and figure any of that stuff out or process through the blocks and distortions and illusions of the ego. Paranoia really comes from a variety of different things. One is that many of these substances um, have properties where they can weaken the structures of the ego. And in some contexts um, where people are comfortable with that, then it can produce an experience that is very liberating. So one of the main concerns of the ego is that it wants to be in control. And it kind of lives through that modality of this illusion of control. And so for many people, when that is challenged, that isn't seen as an opportunity of liberation. It's seen as kind of an oh shit moment of I'm out of control and that there are things that are arising that I'm uncomfortable with. And so as the ego can dissolve, you have an opportunity for a non-dual experience where everything is experienced directly as the universal self with no sense of subject and object or self and other. But, again, when the ego is uncomfortable, rather than letting that dissolution take place, that then it takes its interior aggravations and it projects them outwards. And so then, oh, this situation is making me paranoid. These people are making me paranoid. And there's this feeling of exposure and this feeling of lack of control. So it's just all part of the process. Hey, you gotta let me talk. That's what we're here for. And I'm gonna have to ask you to go somewhere and do something else. What? Because this is for the interview. See, these, there's a camera, there's a camera, there's a camera. And so they're going to ask me questions, and I'm going to give them answers, and then they're making a movie, and so this will be part of their movie. Yeah. Oh. My approach to working with psychedelics is that there actually is no individual self. There's only a universal self. So one way I would describe that is right here in this room right now, we have four different vehicles for this one consciousness to experience itself. And that within that, Martin is a character that this one universal consciousness is playing. And it's a little bit different when we get to my dog because the, there the dog isn't so much a character, she's more of a, a vehicle. Because again, she doesn't have this self-aware function of the ego that also is coupled with this self-editing process that human beings engage in. And through our attachment to the character that we mistake for ourself, we are operating off of projection and attachment to illusions that we project outside of the self as well. Right. So if I'm committed to the illusion of myself, then I'm going to be committed to the illusion of yourself and the illusion of yourself. And then that's what creates you know, all our interpersonal strife and struggle. And so the key to that is, while there might be fantastically amazing or even horrifying things that are occurring within the visionary state, none of that is really of any significance. The only thing that's of significance is what you are feeling. And then, even though sometimes it's hard that you might not be aware of your body, but when you, when you check in with yourself in your psychedelic practice or in your entheogenic states, is then you have to check in. Am I holding tension within my body? Am I holding tension in my breath? You know, because sometimes when people get tense, they might be doing a really good job of appearing to relax in symmetry, but actually they're like this. Mm -hmm. Or they're really tense and then they <sighs> You can hear people breathing, you know, kind of moving through this energy. So it's again, you focus on, okay, this is really big. Just stay relaxed, stay relaxed and stay focused. No matter what it is that I'm seeing right now, I'm looking into a mirror. So if I'm looking into the mirror, and I see God, well, that means I'm in a place of peace and acceptance with myself. If I'm looking into the mirror and, oh, wow, there's a lot of demons out there, that means that there are parts of myself that I'm judgmental around or that I'm afraid of or that I've been trying to deny or repress in some way. So you're saying visions of hell, visions of 
visions of demons is basically from the ego having a negative point of view of the self. Yes. And it's usually built up around some core belief that that individual thinks that they deserve that. Or related to that, that they feel that they are unworthy of receiving an experience of love and bliss and happiness. That, um, you know, people are really, 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 really hard on themselves. Um, many people hate themselves at a very, very deep level. And so this is what shows up for people. And even people who are desperately saying, oh, I want to love myself. If you have this core wound, and all egos are built up around a core wound, right? As we were little children growing up and we realize, oh wow, if I do the wrong thing, if I say the wrong thing, if I act the wrong way, then people are gonna punish me, people are gonna hurt me, people are not gonna respect what I want, right? That we all learn this as children. So there's this wound, rather than just having this heart that is just open and says, oh, I'm in love. I'm in love with everything all the time. That's how most little children are until we start to beat that out of them and we conditionally love them. And then they learn, oh, well, mommy and daddy are actually only nice to me if I behave this way versus that way. So then the whole ego is built up around this core wound. So then when you go into your psychedelic state, it's simply an amplification of that. And sometimes that does take the form of demons and dark energies and torment and suffering. And it's all a reflection of that person's ability to love themselves. And of course, to really love yourself means to be able to love everyone and everything because there is only one universal self. So if you're harboring a sense of rejection or judgment towards anyone or anything, you have an issue with yourself. And that's something that potentially will either be encountered in a psychedelic experience and possibly even resolved. Particularly when we're talking about entheogens, and here this is just a synonym for psychedelics, they work in the body because they um, are chemically structured in such a way that they function as neurotransmitters. Right. Okay. Right. So this is different than say something like alcohol, which is not a neurotransmitter. That's technically it's a toxin that you're taking into your body and that depresses the entire system. But here, when you're working with psychedelics, you're consuming these neurotransmitters and so consciousness, the brain, the way that this functions in the body, this is um, an electromagnetic feature of the human system, right? That when, when we think things, there are electromagnetic patterns that are running in the brain and we're emitting an electromagnet magnetic field around the brain. We also do the same thing with the heart. The heart also um, is primarily comprised of neurons. So the same kinds of cells that make our brain also make our heart, then also in the digestive tract, in the abdomen, okay? So the entheogenic compound, um, we're functioning as a neurotransmitter, uh, actually attaches two different neurological sites within the brain, and that changes the way that electromagnetic energy is processed within the brain, and then also within the body as a whole. So if your ego is kind of the default state, it's the default, the default structure of how energy is running within the brain, when you change up the mix of how that's able to process, that's why you're able to then weaken many of these structures of the ego because you're actually changing the neurochemistry, which is gonna force a change into how the entire system is running. Now, it, that doesn't force you to do anything but it does open up these amplifications of energy, um, which I would then describe as your perceptual ability, right? That you start to, ooh, I'm seeing things moving around. Um, many of these compounds actually enhance your ability to see a broad spectrum of color. So you might, for example, without psychedelics, you might look at something and you just think, oh, that's just one color. But then if you ingest a psychedelic, based, just based on the lighting of the room, you can start to see actually there's many different gradients of color on this thing, but I didn't notice that before. I wasn't really aware of it. So this creates an amplification that allows you to see things in a way that you didn't see before. Mm -hmm. It also does the same thing for hearing and really all of the senses, because all of the senses are based on energy, right? And then it also, in the same way, at the exterior level, allows you to see and perceive 
at a deeper level and with more subtlety, the same thing happens at the interior level while simultaneously bringing unconscious material to consciousness where you can encounter it and resolve it. And actually dissolving the ego um, generally takes both a deep level of relaxation and coupled with um, a large input of energy because again the ego is just a construct of patterns of energy and it also requires focus okay and it's it's focus again not even not just in the body of well, I'm gonna stay relaxed symmetrical and open like this but I'm gonna say focused right here I'm not gonna deviate that I'm focused on this process and not be caught by it especially when working with psychedelics ones that are visual all kinds of stuff arises within the mind Mm. that you see things like, oh my God, what's that? Or where did I go? Or I'm traveling through the universe and look, there's aliens and oh shit, there's a monster with way too many eyes over there. And ooh, that one's coming to get me. The ego itself <laughs> is a collection of energetic constructs. That's all that the ego is made out of. So the ego is not one particular thing. It's a collection of a variety of different things. And these are patterns that influence the ways that we speak, the ways that we act, so I always use the example of you can think of someone who's acting and let's imagine that someone's acting and they need to use some kind of accent for their character. Mm -hmm. So they start speaking in a way that's not normal for them to speak. And then as soon as someone starts using a, a new voice that you can start to see lots of shifts in their body language and behavior. Mm -hmm. when, when we look at a situation like that, we can really see, okay, how this character is this whole package of attitudes and methods of expression. Oh, yeah. Now, the ego is exactly that. It's just that we've been playing the character so long that we're not consciously aware that it's just a character. We mistake the character for ourselves. So anyway, by the do nothing program, um, first of all, I always recommend that people rest in a symmetrical position, something like this, when they're working with any kind of psychedelic. See, the ego almost always operates asymmetrically within the body at an energetic level. So for example, if I want the water, it's over there to the right, mm -hmm. okay? So if I want to get to my water, I have to engage in an asymmetry. So here's a subject-object relationship. Asymmetry, you're talking about movement? Yeah, both movement okay. and also thought, okay? okay? So also, but both what is embodied and then the asymmetries and thought are this, I think this is good, I think this is right, I think this is bad, I think this is wrong. I'm gonna be like this, I'm not gonna be like that. So we create all of these asymmetries where we identify with just part of the possible spectrum of being. So you take a psychedelic and then your job is you do nothing and you just sit here like this. And what happens is as these places of the ego where there, people are holding on, where there are distortions within their system, wherever there are blocks, that those start to become aggravated and they get uncomfortable, right? So you're trying to sit here, relaxed, open, balanced, calm, symmetrical, but you feel this aggravation of, you know, the cops are coming and I've got to do, I've got to close the windows. I need to turn down the lights, turn down the music, right? So then the mind, the ego also gets in there and says, these are things you need to do, right? So that's, then you start to convince yourself that there's actions that I need to undertake. And so again, that pulls you out of symmetry and you start to do things. Or if someone's spiritually minded, then they might think, oh no, well, I should pray and I should meditate or maybe I should light a candle or light some incense and that that will help me deal with this negative thing that I'm undergoing. But again, the program is actually just to sit here and do nothing. And you let these thoughts run in your mind. You're just watching your, what your thoughts are doing. And you're observing it. And then observing how that makes a tendency that your body wants to do something. And so then you become aware that, oh, there's all these patterns that are running within me that I wasn't actually conscious of. And so through these patterns of the ego, what tends to happen is we self-edit and we self-censor. And it doesn't uh, manifest as being authentic and genuine with ourselves. So I, again, I like to make comparisons with my dog. My dog, if she wants to bark, she's going to bark. She's never going to think, should I bark or should I not bark? She's, there's gonna be a stimulus, she's gonna react, okay? And after she barks, she doesn't sit around and think, did I sound like too much like a cat when I did that? You know, what are the other dogs gonna think of me by barking this way, okay? That doesn't occur within her because she doesn't have an ego the same way that we do. When 
these patterns then arise in the entheogenic state and you're resting and doing nothing. What this then does is open up the opportunity for the stuck energy around these patterns to then move up and out. Okay, so this is why people might spend a lot of time laughing or they might have an orgasm or they might have diarrhea, right? It's because these blocks of energy reside here along the center line of the body. And as we decline to engage with the egoic patterns, then it opens up the possibility for that residual unprocessed energy to move up and out. And then when you do that enough, it clears you out. Look, I'm just gonna tell you, all visions are projections. Uh -huh. Just flat out, 100% across the board. Shared They're, projections or individual projections? Well, possibly even shared projections that okay. I would hold that out as a possibility. Okay. Um, so in other words, is there some cosmological principle of Mary floating around out there that people can see? My answer to that is no. You know, the same with Jesus or Buddha or anything else. These are all projections of the self. What I find is that when you take individual cases and start to understand how this particular individual is creating his or her sense of self, then it often becomes very clear how those visions are a projection of that individual. And then when we're dealing with something where everybody's seen Mary, I mean, we have to recognize the fact that human beings are extremely malleable and that from a psychological perspective, you can convince people of just about anything and people can convince themselves of just about anything. It's great. These psychological experiments have been done now where you take a group of people and everybody but one person is in on the experiment and you can show people something up on a screen and then you ask everybody down the line what it is that they're seeing and every person in that room is lying except and they're doing it intentionally. But by the time you get to the last person who's, who's not in on it, they will tell you the same thing that everybody else in the room said, even though you can clearly see right there on the screen is something different. When people claim to see a vision, I think that certainly for many such people, they're not just inventing something out of thin air. There's a real experience that's taking place there. Right. For me, the question is, what is the reality of the experience itself? So here there's a difference between phenomenology and ontology. Phenomenology is what is the phenomenon? Okay, the person says, oh look, I'm, I can see Mary right now. She's wearing a blue dress. She's got a white shawl on and somebody else is describing the same thing. So that's the phenomenon. The ontology is then the question of, well, is that something out there or is that something in here? And if it's something in here, is it possible for more than one perceptual apparatus to see the same thing at the same time? So there's a whole list of questions that are going on there. And then, again, I like to look at it at a case-by-case -case basis, and I don't really like to make really broad statements about cases that I don't really know the details of. So this would be an example of that, that I don't have a lot of details there. Um, yeah, yeah. But I will say that in working one-on-one -on -one with people with psychedelic medicines, I've never once had a case where someone was seeing something that in getting to know the person energetically was not clearly a reflection of themselves and their own concerns and their own projections. It's most likely the case that nothing described in terms of the story of Jesus is historically accurate in any way. Historians have examined all the available documents from that part of the world and in that time period. And in the time period that Jesus Christ was supposedly alive and working and doing his thing, there is not a single historical reference available, which is odd given that Hellenic culture, which surrounded the Mediterranean, was all a literate culture that Jewish culture was a literate culture and Roman culture was a literate culture and that they kept documents about everything, that if there was a trial, they'd keep documents about that. They kept business dealings um, and taxes. And so all of this stuff was written down, not to mention there were kind of pseudo uh, anthropologists that lived at that point in time. Um, and there were cultural historians who lived at that point in time. And there are no references to the Jesus character in the contemporary time period. Wow. Everything comes from several generations after. Sure. And we also know that there were other people that 
had potentially were claiming to be a Jewish Messiah. And we know about them because there are historical records about them. Nobody wrote about Jesus when Jesus happened. Everything comes from after. Mm -hmm. And that there, historically, we can see that most likely the first Jesus writings were just a list of sayings. And that over the generations, then that list of sayings got incorporated into a story that became more and more elaborate with more and more details. But that process took about 100 years. So there's the earliest documents we have um, there's very, very little story. And then, then when we do look at the full spectrum of the Gospels, we'll see that there's a wide variety of different stories about Jesus. Many of them are contradictory. Um, of those, only four of them made it into the canonical Bible, but there are somewhere between 70 and 100 different Gospels about Jesus. Um, and we also now know that in some of, particularly the Gnostic communities, some of them apparently didn't even think that Jesus was a historical person themselves, that they found that suggestion to be somewhat insulting, that for them he's more of a spiritual archetype than not a physical historical person. Whether or not Jesus was a historical person or not, I don't think is a question we can really definitively answer, but we can say, clearly say that there is no uniform account uh, over who he was or what he did or what his life was based on the material that we have and that we also do have some examples of some forgeries. Josephus was a, a Roman um, historian and he visited Jerusalem um, supposedly in the time of Jesus and he wrote down um, an account of all the different Jewish groups that he encountered in Jerusalem at that time. There's no mention of Jesus, there's no mention of Christians and that we have, historians have shown that actually there are forgeries where that when you get later editions of the writings of Josephus, a paragraph has been inserted which says, and there were people who followed a man named Jesus and they called themselves Christians. What stands out to me as a religious studies scholar is like, well, that's kind of interesting that here we have this uh, world historical figure for which there is no historical evidence that all we have is stories that come after the fact that that strikes me as rather curious. Afterlife would require that there actually is an individual self mm -hmm. to experience that afterlife and I reject the notion of the individuated self that my my position on this is fairly succinct. There is only God. Mm -hmm. That's it. There is God experiencing itself through the character that is created known as Martin, living through this particular vehicle, this body right now. Right. When this body dies, there's no more character Martin, there's no more perspective of Martin, and the self that is God is still present, It's because it's all the rest of reality. So it's just one of the vehicles that's gone. Now, when if you ask the question differently, say, well, what happens to God when this body dies? It loses that perspective. Other than that, nothing. Hmm. Nothing happens. Almost like leaves on a tree. Yeah. Mm. Tree's still there. Okay. Leaf is gone. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the universal consciousness that is God didn't come from anywhere, not going anywhere. It's always been here, will always be here because that's the nature of reality. That is what actually exists. All the rest of this that we're experiencing, this is just this one being playing with itself. Now, for individuals who have become conscious of this nature of the self, my supposition is that most likely the experience of death would be experienced as going into an infinite and eternal state of unitary consciousness. Okay? This is also how I describe the full non-dual experience when encountering 5-methoxydimethyltryptamine, 5-MeO-DMT. There's a sense of, oh my god, I'm dying, and then oh, it's all God, it's all infinite light, it's all consciousness, it's all being. and because there's no sense of time there, there's this, the sense of the eternal, the sense of the infinite. So in the process of dying, people who are conscious of themselves, I think most likely would experience that. People who are unconscious of themselves and maybe have aspects of themselves that appear to them as negative, um, then they might experience themselves as going into a hell state. And so as that's happening, it might be perceived as either heaven or hell or someplace in between but it's not actually a place where the consciousness that creates Martin, it doesn't go to that place. It's just revealing that that's what it's always been. 
I've accepted the reality that I'm God, you're God, we're all God. There's no need to take anything personally. There's nothing that needs to be accomplished or needs to be done. That your only real task in life is just to be yourself and to be authentic. Because you are already everything that you will ever be. And it's up to you. You're the only one holding yourself back from anything. You're the only one punishing yourself in any capacity. And so it's just up to you to be yourself. And that's really all that there is to it. But we don't think we have a, a moral obligation to help others. No, there's no such thing as a moral obligation. The moral obligations are simply constructs of the ego. Now, when you recognize other people as yourself, then there is an energetic pull to help them and be compassionate to them and to do what you can for them. There's no moral obligation, however. That that's, that's a concept. That's, that's a requirement that you're putting on yourself. Mm -hmm. There is no requirement. The only requirements are the requirements of the laws of physics, laws of gravity, laws of chemistry, those are the requirements. That without those, we can't have embodied perspectives to sit around and interact with each other. But all sense of morality are just inventions of the ego to try and control the behavior of God toddlers. But that's all that it is. But again, compassion and what we might identify as good behavior arises naturally from the liberated state. So much of our experience is dependent on how we're thinking about it and what we are actively constructing and creating for ourselves so that perhaps in some moments and some opportunities you might be able to transcend and really profoundly transform things. Mm -hmm. um, also, a lot of that might also be social pressure. You know, that, you know when you look at, say, um, Pentecostal churches, there's a lot of pressure on miraculous faith healing in the event where everybody goes to church and everybody's like, oh, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, and they come in and putting hands on people. And then sociological studies have found that you do a lot of follow-up and you find that actually, well, nothing changed. But in that moment, the person was really convinced, I'm being healed or this profound thing is happening. But then maybe we don't actually get the, the results from that. So this is, again, where I would say, you know, maybe, but let's look at each individual case and what people are perceiving as a miracle. And I mean, are there things that occur that we don't really have a quote scientific or medical explanation for, you know, where someone suddenly goes into spontaneous remission of cancer and is like, well, fuck, we don't know why it happened. So yeah, those kinds of things happen. What's the causality? I think that that's open for debate. In general, I tend to be very, very skeptical of anyone's claims about anything um, because I know the, the desire to believe. I know how strong that is. Um, so, and, and I've never personally encountered anyone or anything that has convinced me of anything miraculous. Um, but I'd be more than happy to encounter that. I'd be very interested. You know, like, I would just say, I would love it if Tibetan monks could levitate. I think that would just be the damn coolest thing. I've never actually seen that and been able to have that confirmed. And I also know that in a lot of spiritual traditions, um, magic and trickery is, is a large part of the tradition and that it's used for specific purposes. And so a lot of times that where things are claimed to be miraculous, you know, we have accounts of yogins claiming that they could produce Amrita with their urine. And we also now know, that according to the Rig Vedas, that um, psychedelics were used in ancient Hinduism. And we now know scientifically that psychedelic compounds are passed through the urine. And we know that yogins were taking psychedelics. And so it's very possible for a yogin to eat a psychedelic, wait a little while, pee in a cup, and then say, yeah, I have miraculous urine. <laughs> and you can give that to people, and they will trip. Yeah. Now, you know, I, I've read a lot of Tibetan Buddhist accounts and, you know, things written by lamas and, you know, claims of rainbow body. And that all sounds very interesting. Um, I'd, I'd like to see that. I'd like there to be actual some documentation because I don't actually trust them as authorities. Right, right, right. Um, you know, a number of people have now done studies of Tibetan um, psychic heat practices. So here's a clear case where these Tibetans say, hey, we can take off all our clothes up at the top of the Himalayas and we can dry sheets that are covered in frozen ice. Yeah. Check it out. And then they've brought film crews up and they've done it. And so now we can also, yes, this is absolutely right. real. Now, 
well, where are the levitators? Where are the rainbow bodies? Okay, you've shown us the psychic heat, and this is, and that was actually Richard Feynman who did that like 30, 40 years ago. It's like, okay, well, where's all the rest of the really cool stuff? 